All right, guys. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Heavy Forehands with Toro. This is your host, Felipe Acosta. Some of you guys already met me from the previous episodes where I discuss the Wimbledon final as well as some of other uh, ATP events last week. And I'm happy to be talking with you guys again. Like I said before, uh, thank you for your support. Thank you for your feedback, opinions, and I'll keep uh, digging into it and adding more content and content that you guys like. So let's dig in into this new episode here. We're going to be discussing UTS or the Ultimate Tennis Showdown. This is a series of tournaments that started back in 2020 in the middle of the pandemic. And it was kind of like a parallel league to the ATP level events. Initially, it was uh, thought as a um, way for players to compete uh, during the pandemic. And it was launched by mainly by Patrick Morotolo. He's a French coach, uh, really famous. Uh, he's really charismatic, actually. He's always has some comments about any performance, and especially about the top players. And he's a pretty good coach. He coached Serena Williams. Um, he's always helping Tsitsipas. And recently he was coaching uh, Hulga Rune, uh, the, Den the player from Denmark. And, and he also has a uh, great academy in France uh, where he has a bunch of ITF players as well as future players. Um, so, yeah, really special figure on the tour. And he launched, launched this a series of tournaments where there's, there are different rules into each of the matches. It's not a traditional um, scoring system where you see 15, 30, 40, love, and then you play a set, and then you, you try to win two sets. No, 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 no. This is totally different. These guys created a mix of tennis, football, soccer, into this new tennis event. So, like I said before, the first event was in 2020. It has some traction, but like like you guys know, during COVID, it was pretty tough to have people coming into these events. And I think um, given the nature of these new rules and, and it's some way more interactive, I think entertaining game, it's important to have a good audience. So uh, this event was repeated in 2021, but still, you know, middle of the pandemic still, um, some of the countries were opening up uh, and I believe they were able to have some fans. But I think now they just uh, wrap it up the first um, 2023 event in LA where they had a really big crowd um, they have all the publicity, like all the media to back it up. And I think it went pretty well, actually. So let's start digging into some of these rules. I think it's super interesting. And, and myself as a college player where we play with some different rules, um, it's slightly different, not completely different to the, uh, the traditional tennis system. I think it's super interesting. So let's dig in. Let me, let me read you the rules right now. All right, guys, I'm going to be reading the rules here of the 2023 uh, tournament that was played in L.A. The first one here is that each match consists of four quarters of eight minutes. And if the players, each, each of them wins two quarters, they go and play a hypothetical sudden death. After each quarter, they have a three-minute changeover. So that's... Slightly a little longer rest than the, I think it's a minute and a half, a minute and 45 seconds in between um, the two games played during the set. But look at this, four quarters of eight minutes. Uh, this is so untraditional to tennis. Tennis is one of the sports uh, where you need to go and win the match and time doesn't put any pressure on you. Meaning you can be losing 5-0, 4-11 down, and you can still come back, and the, the clock is not ticking against you. Um, in this scenario, 
the clock is putting a lot of pressure to you because if the clock, um, if the eight minute passes and you're losing, uh, let's say you're down in points. And also, oh, let me add something else, actually. This is not scoring 15, 30, 45, 40, love. It, it is scoring by one, two, three, like, like a regular, kind of like a tiebreaker where each of the guys, they serve twice. So in, in this scenario, if, if the eight minute mark is done, whoever is winning only needs to win one additional point to get that quarter. So for example, um, if I'm playing against, um, I think one Fields was playing this tournament, and I'm losing 15-5, yeah, I, I, I might be able to get five points. 15-5 and eight minutes went by I, I need to get to 16 before Monfils get to 16, right? So he needs to get one point and I need to get 11. There's still that possibility that I can turn it around, uh, but that's where the time, the clock is, t is kind of ticking against me. So during the match, I need to shorten that difference so it's not super tough. Um, so really interesting. I don't know what your thoughts are. Another interesting uh, rule that they have is that they have a 15 second um, clock in between each of the points and and if you're not ready the first one is a warning a regular warning that you receive during a match that's pretty common usually but we have seen this event that the players these are professional players if you're not ready the other player is gonna serve and try to hit that, that first serve in and it may be arranged because the player on the other side is not ready. So that's really interesting getting uh, maybe playing uh, not, not as... Um, yeah, it is more tricky. You need to be a little more street smart. You need to be always attentive. You cannot trust the other guy. And, and also you cannot hang out a lot on the on the change overs and on in between points. Imagine you play a super long rally. Usually you take more than those 25 seconds by the rules. Uh, but in this scenario, they can just serve and if they hit you an ace, you lose the point. Uh, that's kind of interesting. So essentially what's happening there, they're creating a more dynamic game because sometimes tennis is it's a serve, miss return, you had a 25 seconds. And there's never this rhythm into the game. Like, for example, if you watch a soccer game, I know my friends from Argentina and I'm, I'm calling this, I'm calling football soccer and they're killing me. I know back home they're killing me. Um, this is for my American audience. Um, it never stops. It's at 45 minutes, the ball is always playing. And then you have a 15 minute break and then you watch those 45 minutes. So for the audience, it's really interesting. It's, it's all, the ball is already in play. Um, let's say football is kind of like the opposite. It's so slow. Then you have all the dynamic sports like basketball, despite they can call a timeout. It's free dynamic back and forth. And the ball is most of the time in play. And now they're trying to make something similar out of tennis by shorting up the rest in between points. Um, but really interesting. And I think now the fitness uh, is really is way more important. Tennis is a sport where you need to be super explosive, but also you need to be have a cardiovascular um, stamina fairly high just playing, just resting those 25 seconds because you need to hold that intensity maybe for a three-hour match. And now even more for playing, uh, for taking that break of only 15 seconds. So players that they can uh, run forever or imagine imagine a David Ferrer playing this game. He will play a 15-ball rally and he will be ready to play the next point. He will be so good. Okay, let me, let me tell you about another uh, polemic rule. In, and this is the first time they implemented it, I think, so far in the previous uh, editions of the game. Uh, they haven't had this rule, but in the LA edition of the tournament, they implemented the only one serve rule. So they were just hitting a kick serve or a slow first serve, 
putting the ball on the court and the rallies were fairly long all the time. Despite playing on a hard court, right, where usually rallies are maybe four or five shots uh, because they were just kicking the serve in, um, they, this makes the rallies last way longer. So like I said before, I played like maybe David Ferrer would have been great. Diego Schwarzman is great for this game because he's so solid from the baseline and he doesn't have like the stronger serve. But imagine putting um, Ivo Karlovic or John Isner playing this game. It would be really rough for them, despite having great kick serves. Um, and maybe that's one of the reasons why they, ha- they haven't played this, this uh, league yet. This is a really controversial rule because the serve and the return are the most important shots of tennis. And taking the serve away, I mean, they're not taking the serve away. You can still go big. But the best players of all time, if you look at, well, before Djokovic and Rafa, the ones before, they were players with really good serve. Uh, Federer hit so many aces throughout his career. Pete Sampras hit so many aces throughout his career. And without um, having that first serve to go bigger after it, uh, I don't think they will have played that well. So if they will have entered this competition, they will be constrained, they will be limited, and they're actually uh, lowering their level, right? Because some players, they cannot hit uh, an 140 mile per hour serve. And like, for example, Diego, I don't, Diego Schwarzman, I don't think he can. And, and now he's ben- being benefited by this kind of rule. Um, but it will, anyways, but it makes the game a little more interesting because the rallies are always long and is, there's always uh, good competition. Some players, they, they serve well and then it makes the game way slower or no rally. And for the fans, it kind of gets, um, for me, in my opinion, if I go to the court and I, I see A's, 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 it's kind of like a boring game. So from a fan's perspective, longer rallies, a more dispute match, a more even match is more attractive. Another interesting rule that we have here is that coaching is allowed. Coaching in in tennis has been a controversial topic, let's call it. It's allowed in the women's side. I don't know why it hasn't been allowed on the the men's side. Some competitions such as the Labor Cup or the Davis Cup, they allow um, coaching, but so far, um, in the actual ATP events, coaching is not allowed, which it doesn't make sense to me. I mean, at least at the ATP level, most of the players, they have the resources, I believe so. If they, you are top 100, top 120 in the world, to travel with a coach, with a team behind you. So they should allow that team to be on the court and support you on the court, right? Right. If both of the players have the resources to do it, why don't you don't them allow to raise their game? Um, and the other counter argument would be is that it's a one to it's a one on one sport and they shouldn't have that kind of help. It's a single sport, or if it's a doubles, the, those two players they should help each other and that's it. That's a fairly good argument. But in this case, the coaching is allowed and in between points, it's like college tennis. In college tennis, it's the same. Coaches are always giving you tips in between points, fist pumping in between in between points. Not even on the change over, not not only on the change over, but in between points as well. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Coaching is allowed. And then finally, this this one is um, really interesting. It's it's kind of like those board games that they have special cards. They have bonus cards that they can be used during the match. And and the one used in LA was called the next point counts times three. Meaning you're losing uh, 12 to nine. Uh, and then you call, you use your bonus card. And if you win the next point, you're 12 all. So great, you're back in the game. And, and both of the players have one per quarter. Uh, so you have at least four throughout the whole match. And, and it makes the game really interesting because usually both of the players, they are 
waiting until they have maybe 30, 45 seconds in the quarter just to see um, if I'm if I need to use it or I don't have to use it. If I'm closing the score, and and that and that point usually gets really tight. Imagine you only have one serve, and usually they take it on the return because uh, they don't want to miss a serve. So you imagine you're winning 12-9, and you're about to serve, and the other guy he's try to use the bonus card, and you get a little bit tight. Maybe you double fold or actually you just fold on the serve and it's 12 all it's an, it's an even game so yeah that's that's pretty much that's pretty much interesting well now that we have discussed some of the main rules i'm missing many uh let's discuss why they have launched this league and well it, it's it kind of makes sense that they launched this, this league the atp has been a really traditional um, traditional organization like that's always been the same for all tournaments then you have the the end of year masters and their master 1000 in between but overall the same tournaments are played throughout the year and usually they don't change much uh, in terms of um, the schedule right the Australian Open is played um, January through February, then you have the French in May, then you have Wimbledon in July, and then you have US Open in September, right? Only during COVID, those dates were mixed. But overall, it's a really strict schedule. Um, so bringing something different into the mix uh, is it's a really attractive opportunity from a business side and also from uh from the mental health of the players to try to mix it up as well uh usually mental health is never discussed but these players they go through a lot of stress right like there's a lot of pressure to perform they have sponsors they need to make money to support themselves so having just a week for themselves where they can just let go and play for the fans play for just for the good tennis it doesn't matter if they win or lose. They're going to be making money anyways because they're going to be getting paid. And it's also an opportunity for them to get involved with the crowd. Something that they have done in this, uh, I think they did it in the previous editions as well. But in the changeover, they do like a mini press confer conference in those three minutes. And the, usually the two commentators that are discussing the match they jump on a quick phone call with uh, with the players. Uh, and it's usually a one to two, right? Like the two commentators to one of the players. And they just discuss, hey, how was your game? What do you think to play next? What do you think about that shot? Uh, then they might ask some random question like, yeah, what is... What kind of shoes are you wearing? Or are you going to be taking some time off or some... BS or whatever they're talking and whatever they make the crowds laugh uh, in, in those three minutes. So it's usually they split one, and a, one minute and a half for one player, a minute and a half for the other. And something really interesting that happened in this last edition. I don't want to jump in that much on who played this edition, but uh, in this edition there was a match between Monfils and Ben Shelton. Monfils, of course, a French player who super famous and and really charismatic, really good for these events um, because he's so athletic, he makes people laugh, he makes some good comments, and, and he's like really loved from the, he gets the love from the crowd. And then you have Ben Shelton on the other side, American player playing in LA, so he has the support from the crowd and, and he's young, uh, so there's a lot of hope, a lot of hype for this guy. Uh, so it was a really good matchup. And it was getting kind of heated. He really heated because Monville was won, won the first two quarters uh, and he started talking crap, like saying, I'm, I'm going to take you in, in three quarters. I'm going to make it easy. So Ben Shelton in, in that change over told uh, told the commentators, bring bring Gael as well. And so we have a, we have a quick talk. Uh, and Gael was like, yeah, Ben, I know you're going to be a great player. You have a great future ahead. But, man, I'm going to take you down quickly in this match. And then Ben Shelton is so funny. <laughs> so funny. He was like, what do you say? I couldn't hear you with your thick accent. Um, 
<laughs> you know, I am from France, you speak with an accent. Um, Argentina here, I speak with an accent as, as well. <laughs> um, so they were trash, talk, trash talking in the middle of the match, something that would never happen in a traditional tennis match. I don't know how it was before with John McEnroe. I heard it was a little more... Um, more like a jungle, um, but right now they are pretty much um, pretty serious players. They don't they never trash talk, so that was super interesting and it was super fun for the crowd to just to get to see that and also get to see how players are in, in their their actual personalities, right? Because um, sometimes throughout the tournaments, uh, the press conferences are too strict and they. They, they get too serious in terms of the results or how they play. I think only a, a couple of the players really share their life or really share what they think. And it's, that's it. Uh, that would be like an e-curious, I would say. Uh, but then most of the other players are too correct, in my opinion. So anyways, guys, I actually highly recommend to go and watch uh, the tournament, they have a really nice platform called the Ultimate Tennis Showdown, Showdown platform. I'm going to put the link uh, to the website in the, the show notes. And, and usually they stream all the matches and you can rewatch them for free. You don't need to pay. Uh, you don't need to set up. You need to set up an account, but it's, you don't need to set up a premium account. And they also launch a podcast in there where... They interviewed City Pass father. They also had three professional players just interacting. And I think they have five different episodes uh, so where you can hear about the different perspective about this tournament and also get to listen uh, about these players outside of the regular tennis environment. So that's pretty much interesting. So anyway, guys, let's close this one out. It's been a shorter one. Uh, I started, I think, the first episode with 40 minutes. The last one was about 32. And this one I was aiming for 15. But I like talking. I start rambling. I don't stop. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you guys for listening. I'm going to put in, in the show notes all all the links to the UTS. Uh, and go to the website. Take a look. And then give me give me some comments. Let me know your opinion. So thanks again for listening to Heavy Forehands with Toro. Have a great weekend, and we'll catch you guys later when I'm discussing the tournaments of last week. We'll see you guys. (laughs) 